laws. They're all around us. Do this. Don't do that. Did you ever stop to wonder where they come from? The answer is easy. They come from us. That's right. In America, the idea for a law often starts with the people who are governed by it. But it takes lawmakers to give that idea form. This is the story of the legislative branch and its role in the United States government. Give me liberty or give me death. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Ask not what your country can do for you. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Nineteen sixty three. The nation is in turmoil. Slavery may be gone, but its legacy continues to strangle the hopes and dreams of millions of African Americans. Fires of frustration and discord are burning in every city, north and south, where legal remedies are not at hand. Redress is sought in the streets, in demonstrations, parades, and protests, which create tensions and threaten violence and threaten lives. Between May and July alone, nearly a thousand civil rights demonstrations sweep through hundreds of cities. They want change, they want it now, and they want it in the form of a law. A law. Making laws is the job of the legislative branch, one of the three branches of the federal government. That process takes place here on Capitol Hill, home of the United States Congress. The heart of the legislative branch, Congress, has two houses, the Senate and the House of Representatives. Do you know why Congress has two houses? Congress has two houses, uh, I believe, because of the checks and balances system. So that one party cannot control, you gotta, you gotta have some kind of control that. Basically, the two house system was a compromise made at the Constitutional Convention. The delegates were deadlocked over how each state should be represented in the legislature. Large states thought that representation should be based on population. Small states said that each state should have the same number of representatives. So to make everybody happy, the delegates decided to have their cake and eat it too. They created the Senate, where all states are represented equally, with two senators per state regardless of population, and the House of Representatives, where the size of the delegation is based on a state's population. For a long time, the House of Representatives just kept growing along with the country's population. And it got bigger, and bigger, and bigger. So that after a while, it became pretty tough to get anything done. Finally, in 1929, the House of Representatives officially limited its membership to 435. With only 100 members in their house, senators don't just have more elbow room, they have more time to enjoy it too. Their terms last six years, as opposed to two years for the members of the House. Senators also serve a larger cross-section of the voting public than their colleagues in the House do. Every citizen in the state has the right to vote for a senator. Members of the House are elected from smaller areas within the state known as congressional districts, and only residents of the district may vote for their representatives. Senators have to meet tougher requirements for office than members of the House, too. Though both must be inhabitants of the state they represent, a senator must be at least 30 years of age and have been a U.S. citizen for at least nine years. A member of the House can be elected at the age of 25 and only needs to be a citizen for seven years. In the House of Representatives, it is the place where the rights of the will of the majority are absolutely guaranteed. The Senate exists primarily to see to it that the rights of the minority are absolutely guaranteed. That's the only, that's really the difference. But in one place, the majority will prevails, no matter what. And in the Senate, a minority gets a chance to be heard, including a minority of one. It's absolutely critical in a democratic society that both a majority will has a chance to prevail and that a minority voice has a chance to be heard. And the beauty of the Congress, the House and the Senate, 
is that in these two chambers down the hall from each other guarantee those rights. Lawmaking is the province of the legislative branch, but the execution and application of law is left up to the other two branches of government. The executive branch, headed by the President of the United States, puts our laws into action, and the judicial branch interprets them through the federal court system, which includes the U.S. Supreme Court, the highest court of the land. Though the three branches are mostly separate, they are not completely independent of one another. Each branch watches over the other two, creating a system of checks and balances that ensures no one branch gains too much power. When our founding fathers, if you will, of the country as they're called, set up this system of government, they set up a system of checks and balances. They didn't want any one institution of government to control everything. They had seen that happen with a king in England. And they said, we don't want that model here. We want something different. And what they came up with was unique, unique in the annals of history. And they said, we're going to create an executive, sort of like a king, and we're going to give them extensive powers. But as a counterweight to that power, we're going to create two other branches of government, a legislative branch and a judicial branch, to be a check on the other branches so that there's this sense of equilibrium, this sense of balance, like a seesaw. For example, the President is the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, but only Congress has the constitutional authority to declare war. And the legislative branch has another significant check on the executive branch, impeachment. When a President is accused of high crimes and misdemeanors, the House of Representatives can pass articles of impeachment. They send the case to the Senate, which tries the President. If found guilty, he or she is removed from office. But the executive branch has a few checks of its own. Only Congress can pass a bill, but the president can cancel it with a veto. It works both ways, however. If the Congress can muster two-thirds of its membership to support the bill on a revote, they can override the veto. It's like a great big seesaw. Must be why they call it balance of power. Don't forget, while they may vie for power, all three branches have common goals to uphold the law and respond to the will of the people. In 1963, the will of the people was being spoken in the streets, and President John F. Kennedy decided to take up their cause. The cruel disease of discrimination knows no sectional or state boundaries. The continuing attack on this problem must be equally broad. It must be both private and public. It must be conducted at national, state, and local levels, and it must include both legislative and executive action. June 19, 1963. The President sends a bill to Congress to promote equal opportunity in government, education, and employment for all Americans. But the path between a proposed bill and an enacted law can be long and difficult. Partisanship, political maneuverings, and public opinion shape the process at every step. Never was this truer than with the Civil Rights Act. It was about to test the limits of the legislative branch. In a single session of Congress, which is basically a year long, there may be more than 10,000 bills introduced. Even though only a few hundred of them actually become law, that's a lot of paper to chase. Fortunately, there's a legislative tracking system. When a bill starts in the House, it's given the label HR and a number. If it starts in the Senate, it's called S and a number. The Civil Rights Act became known as H.R. 7152. Now it's not easy plowing through 10,000 pieces of legislation. So in Congress, they divide up the work. Congressmen and women sit on committees like agriculture, education, and transportation. After a bill has received its number, it gets assigned to the appropriate committee. Membership on the committees reflects the political makeup of the Congress as a whole. If there's a Republican majority, there are more Republicans on the committees, and they are chaired by Republicans. If there's a Democratic majority, they control the committees. Luckily for President Kennedy, his own party, the Democrats, held the majority in both houses of Congress in 1963. So the leadership in the House Judiciary Committee, where the Civil Rights Act was being reviewed, was also Democratic. And later, if the bill reached the full House, the presiding officer, known as Speaker of the House, would also be a political ally of the President. It hardly meant the Civil Rights Act was a shoo-in, but it gave it a fighting chance. 
But first, HR 7152 had to make it out of committee. That's where bills are reviewed, but in most cases, they just wind up being axed, or as they say in Washington, pigeonholed. Committees are busy places. They conduct hearings with experts testifying about proposed bills. They debate their good and bad points. Lots of the time, they make changes or amendments to the legislation. Committees have other important jobs, too. The appropriations committees are in charge of one of Congress's most powerful tools, the purse strings of the federal budget. For though the executive branch prepares the budget, only the legislative branch can actually allocate money to the various federal programs. The legislative branch, its major function is oversight in many ways, keeping an eye on what the executive branch does. And to some extent, we have control because the power of the purse the branch of government that controls the money that we spend is the legislative branch. The legislative branch supervises executive agencies and departments to make sure they are run well and according to law. The Committee on Economic and Educational Opportunities, for instance, might investigate the effectiveness of the Department of Education's student assistance programs. Special oversight committees are comprised of members who are handpicked by congressional leadership. Really big oversight jobs are given to joint committees whose members come from both the Senate and the House. And really, really big oversight jobs are done by joint select committees, like the one that conducted the hearings on the Watergate scandal. In the early 70s, that investigation ultimately led to President Richard Nixon's resignation. I shall leave this office with regret at not completing my term, but with gratitude for the privilege of serving as your president for the past five and a half years. Committees are king in Congress. One member even said Congress is really just a bunch of committees that get together now and then to vote on each other's work. November 20th, 1963. After six long months of deliberation, the House Judiciary Committee votes to send, or report, H.R. 7152 out of committee. It goes to the Rules Committee on its way to consideration by the full House. Then, two days later, the bill's originator and greatest champion, President John F. Kennedy, is assassinated in Dallas, Texas. The death of President Kennedy could easily have been the death of the Civil Rights Act as well, if not for the leadership of the new president, Lyndon Baines Johnson. This larger-than-life politician was one of the most gifted deal-makers in the history of Congress. As the youngest majority leader the Senate had ever had, he was famous for what his colleagues called the treatment, a persuasive technique that included a good deal of Texas charm and arm-twisting. Senator Hubert Humphrey once said the only way he could resist Johnson was by not answering the phone. In 1960, Johnson was elected as Kennedy's vice president. Though he was well qualified to assume the presidency following Kennedy's death, Johnson knew the road ahead as president would be rocky. He later remarked about that fateful November, I had grave fears about our future. I wasn't sure how successful I would be pulling the divergent factions of the nation together was sure the Civil Rights Act was essential to the nation's health. This American original would use all of his legislative know-how to help it win approval in the Senate. Like the House of Representatives, the Senate splits its work up into committees. But that's where most similarities end. Only the Senate can approve of treaties made with foreign countries. It also has sole approval of presidential appointees like Supreme Court justices or cabinet members. That's a powerful check on the executive and judicial branches by the legislative branch. According to the Constitution, the vice president presides over the Senate. But in fact, most VPs don't spend a lot of time there. And I don't blame them, because they don't have much to do or say. As president of the Senate, the vice president doesn't get to comment on the proceedings or even vote unless there's a tie. The yeas are 50. The nays are 50, the Senate being equally divided, the Vice President votes in the affirmative, and the amendment is agreed to. 
So usually, the most senior senator in the majority party fills in as presiding officer. He's known as the President Pro Tem, which means president for the time. But the real force in the Senate is the majority leader and his or her assistant, the majority whip. The House of Representatives is presided over by the Speaker of the House, and like the Senate, also has a majority leader and whip. The majority leader decides what flows to the House forum and controls the debate of what issues come before the House of Representatives and is a spokesperson for the party. The majority whip makes sure you have the votes to get the job done. March 1964. Almost nine months after it was first introduced, H.R. 7152 finally passes the House and reaches the Senate floor. Its chief supporter is Majority Whip Hubert Humphrey. Surprisingly, the fiercest opposition to the bill comes from members of Humphrey's own party. Dubbed the Southern Bloc, these conservative Democrats often included Lyndon Johnson when he was a senator. But now they are at odds with their own president, certain that the voters back home will not support civil rights legislation. They pledge to filibuster. They just take the floor and talk and talk and talk. They don't even have to stay in the topic at hand. They can read from the phone book if they want. By monopolizing the Senate's time, filibusters hope to have a bill changed or withdrawn. The filibuster is another one of those things that separates the Senate from the House. In the House, there are rules about how long you can discuss legislation, but the Senate prides itself on freedom of debate. The only way to stop a filibuster is with cloture. This rule of the Senate ends the debate and forces a vote to be taken on the question. Today, invoking cloture requires the vote of three-fifths of the senators, or a total of 60. But in 1963, it required 67 votes, two-thirds of the total. In order to reach that number, Democrats would have to convince several uncommitted Republicans to join them in the battle for the bill. The White House looked for an influential Republican who could carry the ball for them. It found its man in Senate Minority Leader Everett Dirksen. In the world of politics, Senator Dirksen was old school, a guy who understood the art of the deal. At first, Dirksen was opposed to the Civil Rights Bill, but once persuaded that it was the right thing to do, he became instrumental in pressing other Republican senators to cross party lines and support it as well. No wonder one of his nicknames in Congress was the Grand Old Chameleon. Changing your mind can be a plus when it comes to legislation. Dirksen himself once said, There are 100 diverse personalities in the U.S. Senate. What an amazing and dissonant 100 personalities they are. What an amazing thing it is to harmonize them. The passage of the Civil Rights Act hinged on the flexible mind of this American original. As the Senate filibuster over H.R. 7152 raged through April and May, public pressure began to build. Everyday citizens, as well as organizations like the NAACP and church groups, lobbied loud and long to move forward with the legislation. By June, Senator Dirksen estimated he'd heard from more than 100,000 people about the bill. A hundred thousand? That's like an avalanche of interest, and it came from people just like you and me. You better believe it got Senator Dirksen's attention. Which proves that as citizens, we are a force to be reckoned with. Your members of Congress have offices both here in Washington and in their districts. Some of them come back home on weekends so they can stay in touch with the people they represent. I tell student groups that to think about representative democracy in its simplest terms is I'm the employee and you're the employer. You have to sort out ways to try and glean where your employer is on a variety of issues. You rely on the mail, now emails a lot. I get maybe three times the number of emails that I do mail. When I come home, uh, visiting schools, uh, visiting businesses, uh, um, organizations around the state are a way to sort of get an idea. So never underestimate the power of the letter, the email, and even the telephone and certainly not the protest march for that matter. Well orchestrated, 
heavy and unrelenting pressure from the administration, civil rights groups, churches, labor organizations, and the media proved, in the final analysis, to be too much for the embattled Southerners. In addition, Dirksen, who was the crucial factor in the outcome, threw his prestigious influence into the balance in support of cloture. When the vote came on June 10, the 100th anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's nomination for a second presidential term, it was decisive, 71 to 29, for cloture. Nine days after cloture was invoked, the Civil Rights Act was resoundingly passed. On July 2, 1964, President Lyndon Johnson signed it into law while the Reverend Martin Luther King and the world looked on. Its purpose is not to divide, but to end divisions, divisions which have lasted all too long. It's important to realize that not every law follows the same path as the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Some start in the Senate instead of the House, and then the whole process runs in reverse. Often the versions of a House and Senate bill are so different that a conference committee has to hammer out yet another version of the bill, which is then returned to both houses for a vote. In fact, a bill can be changed and voted on many times before it goes to the President for his signature. The Civil Rights Act was not a perfect law. Still, it was a giant leap in the right direction. It was an idea, said Everett Dirksen, whose time had come. Why? because millions of Americans wished it to be so, and their will was heard by their elected officials in the nation's capital. The members of Congress manage the nation's purse strings, oversee executive agencies and presidential appointments, and have the power to declare war. But mostly, they shape our ideas into law. They are our voice in Washington, the legislative branch of American government. 